Tommy South observed, you have to give Solomon credit. In his all-out search for meaning in life, once he found out that one thing did not satisfy him, he turned to something else. If it felt good, he did it. If it looked good, he bought it. If it sounded good, he went for it. He lived the American dream to the fullest long before there was an America. What is the American dream? Well, here's a rather lengthy definition. The American dream is the belief that anyone, regardless of where they were born or what class they were born into, can attain their own version of success in a society where upward mobility is possible for everyone. The American dream is achieved through sacrifice, risk-taking, and hard work, rather than by chance. The American dream is often represented by obtaining more and more stuff. A bigger house, a newer car, the latest iPhone, a promotion at work, a new relationship, etc., etc., etc. You know, no matter how many toys children have, they're always interested in visiting the toy aisle at Walmart. This week, if we go to Walmart, we may have to go to the toy aisle out in plain view. Well, as adults, the things we want more of change, but the desire for more does not change. People sleep on the sidewalk to get their hands on the new iPhone as soon as it comes out. Two years earlier, they did the same thing. The phone they could not wait to have has now become a trade-in. That is, if they're lucky enough not to have cracked it. After looking at man's works and the use of wisdom, Solomon turned to other possible sources of fulfillment. He investigated the benefits of pleasure, revisited wisdom, and lamented toil. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, Solomon continues his search for meaning. He has already made the observation that all is meaningless. But as an old man, he is looking back on his life, looking back on his search for meaning. And first, he notes that pleasure is meaningless. Verses 1 through 11 of Ecclesiastes chapter 2. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of the heart of man. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Solomon says that he decided to do a pleasure test. He was just going to investigate pleasure and see if he could find meaning in pleasure. He very quickly tells us that he didn't find meaning there. It too was meaningless. But we notice the different kinds of pleasure that he pursued. He pursued laughter. 
Alistair Begg points out that comedy is fleeting and does not deal with the weighty matters of life. We like to laugh. We like comedy shows. Now, I like the good drama, but if I'm not really wanting to get too involved, I like the short comedy. I like to laugh. But laughter is also fleeting. Laughter is good medicine, the Bible says. But also, laughter can just, at times, just hide our troubles for a moment. Laughter can momentarily distract us from real pain, but it cannot overcome it. Then Solomon said, I turn to wine. Wine was very much a beverage in ancient times. From the beginning, wine has been abused. Scripture warns against drunkenness. But Solomon says, you know, I, I looked at wine, considered that. He didn't find it to give meaning. A familiar refrain on several television shows and movies, when a person has had a troubled day, a troubled circumstance, and they come into the room and they say, I need a drink. And in many homes on television and movie programs, there's always a bar of some kind. Now, I didn't encounter that in anybody's house until Debbie's parents started buying a particular kind of house, and it came with a bar, whether you wanted it or not. And it provided a beautiful display case for, uh, for my mother-in-law's knickknacks. There was never any alcohol in that wet bar. But for many people, they come in and say, I need a drink. I would ask, why? Alcohol and if alcohol isn't your substance of choice, some other drug, is designed to help you cope with life's problems. Many people turn to substances for pleasure or for a coping mechanism. In reality, it doesn't solve the problem. It only covers it up. Well, then Solomon turned to real estate. He described all of the different projects that he undertook. It was Solomon who built the temple. David had gathered all the materials, but Solomon had the task of having the temple built. Solomon built his own palace. It took 13 years to build, and it was bigger than the temple. And then he had all those wives and concubines, and he built houses and shrines for his wives. In fact, we're told he built entire cities. Solomon engaged in the best of architecture, the best of agriculture, the best of engineering. But he didn't find meaning there. Another pleasure was money and possessions. Solomon had so much money that silver was as common as stone. Imagine that. Now, I don't know about you, but if I see a penny on the ground, I still usually bend over and pick it up. The older I get, the more I wonder, is it worth the investment? But I tend to pick up pennies in certain nickels or dimes. <clears throat> Solomon, I don't think, would have bothered. Even silver was counted as nothing. And then he looked for pleasure in sex. He had all those wives and all those concubines. He could indulge in any sexual pleasure he desired. In a sense, he became a hedonist. And Douglas O'Donnell noted, within the house of hedonism, there are many rooms, and Solomon tries to sleep in them all. Now, one interesting thing to remember is that the law of Moses had prohibited multiplying wives. God's design was one man, one woman, for life. It was through the hardness of heart that men began to take multiple wives, and Solomon really got with it on having wives and concubines. We know that those wives caused him to fall away from God. They worshipped idols, keep them happy. He set up shrines for those idols. 
Well, all this pursuit of pleasure. Did Solomon find meaning? No. He no doubt experienced some pleasure, but it did not last. As verse 10 says, Solomon decided, denied himself nothing. But Solomon reached the same conclusion regarding pleasure that he had earlier reached regarding human wisdom. It was emptiness. It was meaningless. In verses 4 through 8, we see a little clue into what may have been part of Solomon's problems. In those verses, we see the word I 11 times. Me and my one time each. Myself six times. Solomon was self-centered. As Denny Petrillo observed, selfishness and self-service are the focus here. Certainly, Solomon would have said that his, this investigation project was all about him. But when you come right down to it, pleasure is no substitute for God's gift of genuine happiness. It is no substitute for being able to finally face God with confidence and joy. In our nation, in many nations of the world today, people are pleasure addicts. We simply cannot get enough thrills. We need bigger and more exotic fixes to keep us going. And so people take a stronger drug. They drink more alcohol. They look for another relationship. They buy the latest iPhone. They're seeking pleasure, trying to find satisfaction. But it does not satisfy. Someone said pleasure is a good thing that it turned into a God thing becomes an enslaving thing. Well then, Solomon turns back to wisdom, verses 12 through 17. He's already said in the first chapter, you know, I didn't really find meaning there, but he addresses the subject again. Then I turn my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done. I saw that wisdom is better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise man has eyes in his head while the fool walks in the darkness. But I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. Then I thought in my heart, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being, being wise? I said in my heart, this too is meaningless. For the wise man, like the fool, will not be long remembered. In days to come, both will be forgotten. Like the fool, the wise man, too, must die. Solomon was the wisest man of his day. For many days before him. He had asked God for wisdom. It had been granted. And he exhibited his great wisdom early in his reign. It did not keep him from forsaking his Lord. But he had been given this great wisdom. But as he thinks about wisdom, he says, well, I compared wisdom with madness and folly. What will the king's successor do after him that has not already been done? He said, wisdom is better than folly, comparing light with darkness. But he says, you know, in the end, whether you're wise or whether you're foolish, you die. Both die. I've known some very wise men. They were well educated, yes, but also showed wisdom. Sadly, like every other person, they died. Jack Lewis didn't quite make it to 100 years old. Stafford North, a very wise man in the Word of God, died at age 90. But they died. And Solomon says, the wise man like the fool will not be long remembered. Now that's a generalization. After all, we're still talking about Solomon several thousand years later. But in general, 
whether you're wise or whether you're not wise, you die like everybody else. And after a while, most people forget you. Death is indeed the great equalizer. What Solomon is saying is, I did not find meaning in all my wisdom. And then Solomon has some words to say about work. And he says, work is meaningless, verses 18 through 23. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun, because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work is pain and grief. Even at night, his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. Well, Solomon, as king, did work. Now, he put a whole lot of other people to work, whether they wanted to work or not. But he was king. He had his responsibilities. In fact, his work at times disturbed his sleep, he says, kept him up at night. But he says, you know, I've done all this work. I've accumulated all this money, all this stuff. What is going to happen to it when I die? It's going to be left to somebody else. Are they going to be a wise man or a fool? Well, Rehoboam took over when Solomon died. He certainly was not wise. His behavior brought about the divided kingdom. This great kingdom that Solomon had ruled divided. Ian Proban <coughs> calls this section of Ecclesiastes, the confessions of a workaholic. They are those who get caught up in work, and they work so much, trying to provide more and more for their family, and end up losing their family in the process. A child may not confess this, but they would rather have a few minutes of their parents' time <coughs> than the latest toy. People work hard, accumulate a lot of money, they die, they don't take it with them. A well-worn cliche reminds us that you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. If you make all this wealth, you leave it to your children. What are they going to do with it? Statistics say that 60% of inherited wealth is completely gone by the end of the second generation. Children and grandchildren have a way of blowing it. But Solomon concluded that work is also meaningless. But in verses 24 through 26, we have a little change of direction. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat and find, or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Denny Petrillo observes, a major break occurs at chapter 2, verse 24, where the author inserted God into the discussion. The revised thesis of the book becomes, with God, all is not vanity. We will see this most clearly at the end of the book. But here, we have mention of God, and that God can give meaning 
to all of this meaninglessness. Solomon exposes us to the failure of all his experiments to show us that what he missed in all his efforts was the simple joys God held out to him. All his experiments failed, so now he finally turns to God. God is gracious to Solomon and us in exposing the failure of everything else to satisfy him. God allows us to feel the meaningless of our efforts in order to drive us to Him. If we have enjoyment in life, we should be thankful. If, we, if not, we should recognize that we're probably looking for it in the wrong place. Solomon learned to his dismay that he could not make himself happy. In reality, no one can make himself happy. God has to give us genuine and lasting satisfaction in life. Sooner or later, we have to face up to the kind of lifestyle we've chosen. And we find that nothing ultimately satisfies. We think we need more to be happy. But when we accumulate more, we are still not happy. In Ecclesiastes 2, Solomon attempts to expose this philosophy as garbage. Pursuing the American dream has become a nightmare, or can become a nightmare, if we try to find meaning in just obtaining more. Countless numbers of people have tried to find meaning in life, tried to fill the empty life with something new or something different. It does not work. I believe it was 1991. We were living in Virginia. We had been here in Texas and Oklahoma visiting family. As we were on the way back to Memphis, I called Philip Slate, one of my former professors, and he invited us when we got to Memphis to spend the night with him and Pat, his wife. That was two adults. How many children we have? Three children. <laughs> two adults and three children. <clears throat> I accepted the invitation. And what impressed me was when we got there. Here is a man who is a professor at a graduate school. At least part of the time he preached on a regular basis. I was impressed with the humbleness of the house in which he and Pat lived. And when they moved to Abilene and I moved to Texas, and I went out to Abilene for lectureship, several times I stayed with them. And once again, it was a very humble home, a nice home, but no mansion. They had learned contentment a long time ago. That things weren't important. That service to God is what mattered. And I'm glad that I have Bill and Pat as friends, as brother and sister in Christ and as mentor. Because they helped me to understand what is truly valuable in life. And that is what Solomon was talking about here in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Shall we stand in the